Yeah, hello and welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the third evening of Human. We are so glad to have everyone here tonight and hope you are as excited as we are um, as we explore the activities and the performances that we're going to hear tonight. I am Joanna. And I'm Jack. This evening is a bit different from the previous evenings that we've had so far in Human. And we are going to engage in different activities. As we can see, there are different stations across the room. And um, yeah, we are going to see how the human senses are able to produce creativity. Indeed. And we're also having some performances. We're going to be thinking tonight about what does it mean to be human? And we're doing this in particular by <laughs> thinking about the human senses and saying, well, how do they make us human? We're kicking off the night with a couple of performances. We've got Rahana Namani with some rhetoric, and then we'll have Glenn giving us some poetry. Rahana, would you like to join us? Tell us a bit more about what you're going to be doing. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to be reading a poem that I wrote. Uh, which focuses, thinks about that question um, Jack just asked about what does it mean to be human. Cool. Please give a round of applause for Rihanna. <laughs> breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Pause. Think. Okay, maybe you don't think that hard. Breathe in, breathe out. Eat. Sleep, wake, repeat. The average life of a human, but to be human is something more. They say to be human is to err, to get things wrong, to make mistakes. It's second guessing the choices that we make every single day. To be human is to fall in love and then again, then once more. And yet every time is different from the times you've loved before. It's the feeling of grass beneath your feet. It's the sand between your toes. It's the wind hitting you square in the face and that annoying itch you always get on your nose. It's the days you'll never forget and the nights you probably won't ever remember. It's the peace as you lie by the fireplace as the flames strip down to embers. Being human is rereading the last page so that the story never ends and so it's not done. It's that moment in the film where a single tear starts to run. It's your heart beating fast as you choose your next step. And it's the warm kind of happy you get when the wine goes a bit to your head. But it's not all laughter and happiness and sunshine, not all blankets and hugs and joy. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Pause, think. Okay, maybe not that hard. To be human is to get caught in the rain without a coat. It's your mood changing instantly when you hit that wrong note. To be human is to find yourselves gradually growing apart, to look back and remember the old days and wonder how they are. Being human is not knowing how to say what you mean. It's not getting that job you really want. It's watching that person fall in love with someone else. It's feeling that all you do is mess up. Being human is that feeling I can only describe as the waves crashing all around you and that numb lack of feeling in the drowning after, that kind you only understand if you knew it for yourself. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Pause, think, just for a moment, because being human doesn't stop there. To be human is to believe that it gets better. It's to believe we were made to do more than just survive. It's why we love superheroes and magic and wonder. And it's why we keep going in life. To be human is to dream, to have wild ideas about the adventures you'll have. It's to want to reach higher than the people before. It's keep climbing that mountain until you can stand on the summit. It's punching through glass ceilings. It's kicking down doors. It's swallowing your pride, puffing out your chest. And it's finding the courage to get off the floor. To be human is to have a bunch of unearned confidence while also never thinking that you can. It's the wild burst of contradictions that's existed since the dawn of man. Being human is that longing and desire to be loved and known, to belong, to find home, to be not just glanced at, but seen. To look beyond now and continue to dream, breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Pause. Think. Imagine, keep going, eat, sleep, dream, wake, 
live, repeat. Um, uh, last year, Easter fell on the same day as um, April Fool's Day. So uh, it got me thinking a, a lot about how the Easter story within uh, the Bible is uh, comedic. It's a funny story. Um, and so it got me writing a few different poems about uh, Palm Sunday, which is the Sunday before Jesus died on the cross, and then Good Friday. Uh, the, night, the day that he did die on the cross, and then Easter Sunday when he rose again, how each of those are comedic. So I've written it in the style of stand-up poetry. Here we go. In between the poems, there's going to be a couple of videos as well. A funny thing happened on the way to Jerusalem. So there's this guy who says that he's God, repeatedly. And he's not a fraud, he's the still center of sanity, no hint of vanity, purest humanity, but he's God, and he needs you to know that he's God. He's God on a mission. He's got a real Messiah complex, the original condition. A Messiah complex with a death wish, and that's the joke, because when he spoke his claim, all would complain, crying, prove it. And he says, I'll show you I'm God, watch me die which is odd as a sign of deity, but he doesn't just say it, he hurls himself fierce at the grave, declaring that this is the behavior of divinity. He'll assert his infinity by choking to death to croak his last breath in rasping benediction. He's the fountain of life, and the clearest depiction his convictions non-fiction is a cry of dereliction, one hell of a crucifixion. There's this guy and his God, and he must die. On this, he'll insist. It's the item on his bucket list. He's Messiah with a death wish, and while for us, dying would represent a distinct lack of ambition, for him, it's his mission to be slain as a lamb. He said, when I am lifted up, then you will know that I am, that I am who I am. Then you'll know that it's not a scam to see him damned by earth, hell, and heaven. Then comes recognition. Here's the definition of glory. So in this story, the king marches to his throne, his face set like stone to ascend the hill and assert his will to reign in state. Protocol dictates he should ride a steed of noble breed, perhaps a stallion and behind his battalion, and so to his office succeed. But here's the thing. This king rides a donkey, or two, so Matthew reckoned. He remembers a second. An old cloak laid astride these two brutes side by side. So picture the scene. Lining the road, Israel's priests and people, and God all precarious atop these two beasts, a royal charade, a half-assed parade. And they're hailing him king, and he looks like a fool, and still he rides on, the irony cruel, because he knows that the crowd enraptured in praise will bay for his blood in a matter of days. But still he rides on down this road. He cannot be slowed. On this trajectory locked, he will be mocked and forlorn, his figure torn, majesty shorn, crowned by thorns with nails adorned, enthroned in scorn, his kingdom borne across trembling shoulders. Yet on his soldiers. For this is his divine vocation, decidedly not an assassination. Somehow it's his coronation, because here the fountain is comprehended when we see it full expended. When we see it full expended in death, the life spring crimson poured becomes the proof that he is Lord. So on he rides in asinine glory. Easter is a funny story. Thanks. Camera's rolling. What is life? What kind of tale? Comedy or tragic fail? Not is life funny, it's mostly not, but is it hopeful? What's the plot? The classic tragedies are frown, you travel up then tumble down. In turn, a comedy's a smile, you plumb the depths but end in style. It's not about the laughs or pain, it's all about the final frame. Flick to the end and simply question, is there a wedding or a funeral procession? That's the difference. Now we ask, what should be the actor's mask? In this world, what story's sold? Is the happy ending told? No, here's the pattern. Each wretch stumbles up the compost heap, then tumbles down to loneliness and loss. But painted thinly, this the gloss, a glistening hedonist directive. Make attainment your objective. Grasp and grab and climb and take, then perish, never more to work. Your life is tragic, first to last, no matter how the middle's cast. We're biological machines, reading glossy magazines.
So swill your latte, watch the clock as time ekes out. Tick tock, tick tock. Unless. Unless one story comes in view, unless the comedy is true. The author written in to twist the plot within our tangled midst To plumb the tragedy and gloom, kill death by dying, split the tomb And by this anti-entropy to wreak sublime catastrophe Now through the valley, death destroyed, he pioneers a cosmic joy Beside this tale, there's only sorrow He alone secures tomorrow Hope for earth's embodied living, future righted, wrongs forgiven You see, the tragedy is vain Begins in pride and ends in pain Forsake this desperate ever after. Turn instead to Easter laughter. Cut. Here's the poem about Good Friday. A funny thing happens on the way to the execution. Did you hear the one about the God who croaked? It's quite the joke. He's this bloke, shows up broke among downtrodden folk, spoke truthful, tilt words spilt. He's a Jew doing stand-up with a northern lilt. Built worlds with his words, provoked laughter, stoked rage, awoke guilt in the powerful then to assuage. But his shtick uncloaked the proud, pricked the tra- his shtick uncloaked the crowd, pricked the proud. He plowed dangerous and deep to the core. And history saw that when truth is so uncouth as to speak, we freak in frenzied violence. We're proud to be woke, but when God spoke, we choked him to silence. That's the joke. Heaven came, heaven came preaching, earth would not hear. We said, shut the hell up, which was his whole idea. He said, I'll set you free, so we put him in chains to teach him who or what on earth really reigns. So God goes on trial. The file against him's thin, but they pile in. Accusers line up through the night, but none turn out to line up right. And all the while, God pleads the fifth, an adamantine monolith. He will not balk. They knock, they mock. They hurl their mud against the rock. Nothing makes him talk. And not one accusation sticks except the one he fixed on from the start. He's God. Implacably so. Well, case closed. He has to go. What's he done? None can say. But for who he is, God must pay. Here's the shock. The judge is put in the dock. The guilty sit on high and make their verdict. Life must die. The truth is held in contempt of reason. The king convicted of high treason. And to cap it all, their genius trick, God's declared a heretic. So the mover of worlds is pinned to a stake, his thirst unslaked, his lifeblood taken, earth shaken, God forsaken. He turned his cheek, earth clenched its fist and hammered heaven's pacifist. And the man who drove the nails, the soldier who impales his maker with a spear, to him it's suddenly clear, however odd, this is what it looks like to be God. Not a, hu- not a thunderbolt hurled, arms wide open to the world, forgiveness unfurled to his murderers. This is God, covered in blood. This is good. It's good Friday, if you credit it. It's good news, if you let it. It's a good joke, if you get it. Thanks. Born sinking into quicksand Listen up this time Born sinking into quicksand A sick land So you gotta listen up this time Born sinking into quicksand A sick land A bit down From the first time Reverse slide Down a black hole grave A black hole cave With nothing to say Hey Just sinking into quicksand A slick shine A quick span 30,000 days No delays in the haze Dismissed And it's looking like morning mist we're sinking into quicksand, a sick plan, a no plan, just a settled fate, a destined day, a testing way. Like a spider in the bar, trying to make its way out, desperate for deliverance, destined for the spout. Here we're sinking into quicksand, we tried to stand, we tried to climb, buy some time, cut the deal, make a bill that we know was so real. Where's anyone up there? Does anyone care? Can anyone hear us? Cause everyone's scared. Does anyone know? Do they hear or shout? Will anyone rescue and lift us up? Zip! Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Like a cannonball shot from celestial skies On the farther side of the van nose back Like a cannonball shot from the sun that you plummets On a bear in a sharing on a deathbound despair Like a cannonball shot using lovers ammunition On a mission of collision causing catastrophic vision To a caring coalition with morticians And down to earth he comes to reverse all natural ambition The people said stranger you're doing it wrong You should prolong your days and keep well away from the rabbit Face like a stone, he sinks alone to the beckon in black. No coming back. Cause he's a cannibal shot from the heavenly high, diving down to the darkness, exploding with light to demonic destruction. A new head divides, blow a hole through death to the other side. Seems to sink it into quicksand, but this man now he stands on the other shore. So now, the final poem, Easter Sunday. A funny thing happened on the way to the tomb. This will make you smile, so God's dead. Not the most fertile ground for comedy, but stick with me a while. God's dead, he bled out on Friday before dusk, a husk of a god buried in sod, planted in a virgin tomb, an unpromising womb, but I guess that's his style. Now, Saturday was a holy day, and anyone, everyone needed a rest after killing God, so they, just, they decided to put aside a day to recover from the day aside. Which brings us to Sunday, and there are some women who really want to attend to God's corpse, because, of course, it's bad manners to have God rotting in the tomb. You should at least perfume the cadaver, and so they have a journey ahead. As they tread this path, they disregard pretty much everything he said, because he told them that he was God and death could not hold him. So if any were believing, they would not be grieving. They'd presume that service would soon, presu soon resume. They'd camp beside the tomb and wait for God to self-exhume. But no one believed God, not even his believers. We can't conceive a higher power, not really, not higher than the grave, which will devour. That's the one to make us cower, this glowering conqueror of light. It's never lost a fight. Each extinguished breath declares that death is Lord. It scored a victory over every rival. At God's arrival, we briefly entertained a doubt. Maybe life's in with a shout. But on Friday, he was out for the count. And we went back to perfuming our cadavers. Because all we have, it seems, are corpse preservation regimes. And so these women resign themselves to a truth alarming. Even God requires embalming. And then... It's empty. He's not there. Not in the place where he lay, not in the domain of decay. Death made its play, but God made a bolder move. He's won. They're stunned. None dared believe it, but now, now they're crying. Life has killed death by dying. He's devoured the beast that swallowed him, crushed the abyss by falling in, destroyed destruction from within. The seeds burst out on Easter morn. The sun from the virgin tomb is born. The valley of shadow receives its dawn, and a hole through death is forever torn. These mourners look through to see him, and to see him is to view home. Home shorn of thorns, home reborn, home adorned with golden hue. On Easter Sunday, this the view. It's country walks and heartwarming talks, mind-blowing preachers and breakfast on beaches. It's feasting and family and peace and grace. And Jesus, our battle-scarred brother, face to face. Maybe we came to the tomb to pretty a corpse and honor the dead, but today instead we meet a living God. And so with a tremor in our voices but steel in our bones, we dare to step on the monster's neck as it writhes under a victor's blow. And in the face of hell, we bellow, O oh, grave, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? We sing the happily ever after. Here begins the Easter laughter. Thanks. Thank you so much, Glenn and Rihanna, for the thought-provoking performances. And as I said earlier, um, tonight we're going to engage in different activities um, in response to the things that we just heard and seen. 
So as you came in, you probably have seen the different stations across the room. Each of these represent a sense we have as humans. Um, in each of these stations, there will be someone to explain the different activities and a board containing a question um, that will challenge us to think and reflect what it means to be human. Um, the helpers from each station, can you raise your hand so people can see you? Cool, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so please take your time to explore each of these senses and we'll see you again in 20 minutes. Enjoy. Hello, hi everyone. So um, I hope you enjoyed some of the activities, learned something. Uh, if you'd like to make your ways back to the tables, um, the activities, they can be done later in the night as well. But for now, we've got a couple more performances. And first, we've got Mike Hood, who's going to be giving us some more poetry. And then we're going to be hearing from Matthew Mooley, who's going to do a rap for us. So I'd like to welcome Mike Hood. Brilliant, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry to be the, the, the person that's bringing people away from the cake. Um, so if, if I'm doing that to you, I apologize. Please forgive me. Um, yeah, I'm just going to do, um, I'm just going to do two, uh, poems, one, uh, short one first and then a, a longer one after that. Um, and yeah, I, I hope that you like them. The first one is called Reason. Once I heard a wise man sing. He was grisly, and his hair was so long and thick that he could pick it up with his hand and put it behind his head. He sung with his eyes closed. And when he stopped the songs and people asked for more, he said, okay, but first he'd tell a story. He said he knew a Navy SEAL once who'd been sent into a compound to recover a long-term hostage. Long-term hostage, long-lost term. Long remembered, long forgot, long lost, lone, forget me not hostage. They kept him in what used to be a hospital. Hot now, dirty. Sandbags blocking up the window so it's dark except the on off yellow of a not quite working bowl. Beaten, left. Not quite sleep for days, bereft of nights, just flickering and semi conscious sights of them, of guns and grins, of dirt and boots and semi conscious sins and darkness and the taste of blood. And everything was dry. Long term, long term, and now he does not cry. But they'd found him. They'd been sent to get him out, and he could hear the guns, the boots, the shouts, the door burst open, and in they come, and there he is, full grown, shaking, lying on the floor, curled up, feet against the wall, curled up, eyes shut, shirtless, strangely small, and shaking. He looks up, eyes bright, rodent-like, and scared. He doesn't move. Okay, okay, come on, let's get you out of here, let's go. He doesn't move. These men with guns cannot be trusted, just another set of Satan's sons. He doesn't move. He cannot, will not, shall not, does not, durst not, dust, shot through with alien light, settles slowly. The soldiers look at one another and they don't know what to do. Then one man looks into his trembling eyes. He lays his gun upon the ground. He puts his helmet down. He takes his body armor off. The others do not make a sound. Just watch him, puts the armor down. Undoes the buttons on his shirt, lays that down too, and then his vest, until there's nothing left except his chest rising and falling sharply with his breath. And then he walks slowly to the corner where this hostage lies and lies down next to him. And he curls himself around the man until their skins are touching. The other men would not have done this. We're here for you. We're here to rescue you. Will you come? And for a moment, the only sound was their naked, shallow breathing. And as we sat there, Wrapped by this wise man with crackling voice saying, will you come? He looked down and to the left and put his hair behind his head and said that he was a follower of Jesus now. And that story was his reason. 
And you could hear behind his words that naked, hallowed breathing. Thanks. Great. Um, yeah, and this next one uh, is, is called That Big Tree, and it's basically a seven-minute fairy tale. Uh, at some point, I was, I was at university. At university, you feel like you can do anything. And I thought to myself, could I write a poem that would be the whole story of the human race in one poem? And foolishly, I attempted it. Um, and I, I don't know if I've really succeeded, but I, I quite like it, so uh, we'll give it a go. It's called That Big Tree. Sun. The voice is warm like a log fire. It's got the crackle of age, but something in the throat is brave and true, like it would tear itself to shreds to save you. And it's soft and wizened, like the little leather book your granddad gave you. Remember what I told you, he says. Okay, Dad. He's restless, young, throbbing like a chosen one, because he's always been the only son since before he can't remember. So he says, okay, Dad, and rocks back and forth on his feet. What did I tell you? Don't climb the tree, just that big tree beyond the garden at the edge of the wood. I know nothing survives there, nothing that's good. Just don't climb that tree at the edge of the wood. And the son nods and rocks back. And his father's eyes ache and burn with all the fires of history. And he says, go on then, son, go on. And off he goes. Fast, fierce, coursing like blood through strong veins he goes, throwing the past behind him. And he splashes through the creek so fast he doesn't see the smooth stones glitter underneath his feet and the sun glistens on his proud, sweating brow and he's too big to listen, too small to know how until the penny drops and his feet stop and he comes to the tree. That big tree beyond the garden at the edge of the wood. And he looks up and it's tall and it's a climber. Its long sidewards branches beckon in their woody way and seem to say, sneering, Are you brave, little one, for the climb? Yes, I am. But you're only a child. I don't think that you can. Well, I think that I can, and I think that I will. As long as you're fair and you keep standing still. Very well, very well. I'll give you my word. While you climb, I'll be still. That's not what I heard. You can't trust what you hear. Believe what you see. Look, foolish child. I can't move. I'm a tree. So he grits his teeth. And he catches his bottom lip and he knows it'll bleed, but he doesn't care because he's man enough. He knows he is and it must be dust in his eye, he swears, as he hauls himself up onto the first branch. And he's already thinking that he might be a fool, but he's not a coward. He won't be a coward. So he clambers on, onwards and upwards. Don't look back. Don't look down. No room for doubt. No room for the fear rising up in his chest like a cold, hard stone from the bottom of the stream that then... He hears it, remember what I told you, just don't climb that tree. And he swallows the stone down hard because he will not stop. He will not be a child for one more day. He will not be the little one. He will not be the one who's never climbed the tree and doesn't even know what it looks like up there. And he wishes that he had a younger brother that he could be bigger than as he reaches for the last branch and pulls himself up. And as he lifts his leg over, he feels the branch shiver beneath him. Just lightly, quickly, like a chuckle. And then again and again, like the tree is laughing at him and it's bigger and growing and it's mocking and groaning until everything roars with a bellow of a sick joke that's so old it's scrawled on the walls of the world and he screams, you said you wouldn't move. Now what did I say? I'll be still while you climb. You can't trust what you hear, least of all when it rhymes, but still. I was faithful, I kept to the deal, but the climb's over now, so things might get surreal. And the fear stone rises up in his throat, cold, hard, and it sits, pressing against the base of his skull as he waits for the world to end. But the world bends. And the tree twists and turns and squirms itself inside out like a worm until he doesn't know which way's up anymore or if there even is one or just down, just round and around and down the rabbit hole, down where the dark things wriggle and writhe and then silence, darkness, trip, drop. Hello, hello, drop. Who's there? It's only me. Who are you? 
you'll see. How are you here, same as you, climb the tree? What? Why? To prove that you could? Or did your father not warn you that nobody should? Well, actually, that's funny. That's quite different to you. I climbed because that's what dad told me to do. What? No, how could he? You're taking the piss. What dad puts his son through something like this? He hears a faint sigh. Did he explain to you why? Oh, yes, yes, he did. And now I know that it's true. He said one day, if I waited, that I would find you. And it hits like a wave and he knows it's true. And it almost feels like he always knew, like every breath he'd ever breathed had been a clue to this. And then out of the darkness, a hand takes his, and once again, the whole world melts, but this time in a good way, like an ice cream on a too hot day. And he can almost feel himself dissolving. He can smell the ambiguities resolving, and he's falling in love, but not like that, upwards. And the joy of it sings right down into his toes, and he knows that he's mixing his metaphors, but he doesn't care, because he actually feels like a bird of the air, like a stray dog coming in from the cold, like a miracle breathing, bright to behold, and he feels like he's underwater. He can hear that strange, silent hum in his ears, and his heart beats deeper, pumps out all fears, and his old soul dances in slow motion, but at the same time, It's like he's just been pulled out of the ocean. He's lying on the lifeboat, lungs exploding with air because he's actually alive. Now go forth and thrive, infinity and beyond, mate. Reach for the skies because as he opens his eyes, he sees heaven and earth shatter into a sea of glass. When all the shadows pass away at the molten voice of this brand new age old brother of his, And the hand holds his as if nothing else is, and he's free. Because they are lost together, him and the one who had waited forever. They are lost, they are lost, but they are together. Him and the one who had waited forever, and this little boy feels found. And he feels dewy grass beneath his feet, and they're running now. And they can see the river flow below and the sun reflects so bright it's like a torrent of dancing stars. And they dive in headlong and the water's cold and clear and the flecks of light ripple over his skin as he swims and it feels like the first kiss of dawn, like he's being reborn. And as they scramble out onto the bank, their feet slip and slide on the smooth stones and they laugh. And the sound sparkles off the mountainsides. And then he hears the sound of crunching, eager feet running on the stony beach towards him and a voice. And his heart beats hard, a thumping, eager in his chest. And then the fear comes, but now it goes because he knows that he is not alone. And he knows that voice. Warm like a log fire, it's got the crackle of age, but something in the throat is brave and true like it would tear itself to shreds to save you. And he feels warm, strong arms reach out and hold him and he knows that he is not alone. And the voice says softly, welcome home, boys. Welcome home. Thanks. Can everyone hear me? Cool. All right. So I'm I'm gonna do a couple songs that I wrote uh, from last summer. So um, uh, this first one is called Hope, and it's really just uh, spawned out of a place where, you know, I'll just be trying to think of lyrics or something, and then this is what came out. So um, yeah. Uh, let's go. Oh, sorry, Joe. It's the um, it's the other one. Sorry, man. <laughs> sorry. That's no, all right. Cool. Yo, I hop scotch down this alleyway I'm tumbling lost and I feel shocked I feel my head drop 
Cradle in hands, this is my conscious Feel my thoughts is nonsense Cradle in hands, I'm feeling noxious Can't stop, I swap Pokemon cards Was in the playground of school of life Still I'm trying to get it right Surrounded, spinning round and round Lost and found, round and round Lost and found, bound But my past ways, past days A crowded house, gonna dream it's not over And our house, it's a madness Feeling sadness, I spit Born in October 29th And I fight the sadness, I spit All of these lyrics, it's a piece of heart These showers, I spit My feelings tower, black power coma Back of pocket and it's supersonic Different melodies, melodic I spit All of my conscience, I'm just being honest Problems I spit, materialism How this happened to me, I lost all my grip I feel frustration, things is problematic Panic, feeling frantic, get the thought of All the time we're running out of But there's still another day, we gotta nurture these surroundings And all the blessings that it's brought us And the summer sun shimmers in the sky Right before us, even when there's torture And after rain it all shine bright and still relentlessly we ride I got my mother and my brother Pops was playing hide and seek And still I weep at this charade It created all these problems But my confidence was saved And I'm speaking out these songs That I had scribbled on this page Still I'm spitting out these scribbles Feel I'm spinning in a maze Can somebody help me? I feel it's common Not unusual to feel this type of way I feel it's probably unusual To feel good all the time I feel that's probably something we should know I'm speaking through these rhymes Still got hope And still the sunshine spreads Amongst the flower beds Hope Sunshine on the flower beds, hope Trying to nurture it and share it through these lyrics Still got hope, just know that you can grow despite all your demons Still got hope, just know that you can grow despite all your feelings uh. All the demons, uh, just know that you can grow despite all your feelings I feel my line of sight, it blossoms in the light So I might just stop and bask in light Wish I could be besotted with this light Wish I could be besotted with this light Feel my heart start and stopping at the sight Cause line of sight blossoms in the light So I might just stop and bask in light Wish I could be besotted with this light I wish that I could be besotted with this light I feel my heart start and stopping at the sight Because line of sight blossoms in the light So I might just stop and bask in light Wish I could be besotted with this light I wish that I could be besotted with this light I feel my heart start and stopping at the sight oh. That was it, that was had thought. Uh, hope, sorry, cool. Cool. So that was called Hope, and um, this next song is called Had Thought. So let's go. Mm. So crofters and frosties, my posture is lofty. Four fosters inside me makes my knees all wobbly, and I'm sorry, I do apologize. Cause I still feel like I'm still trapped in my prison And if my rope, can someone out there give me some hope? Life like the hedgehog, I'm trying to stop Look, listen to these lyrics I wrote And pay attention, EQ's compression on the melodies Like merry melodies on the VHS memories Heavenly, and now this innocence and bliss is all in jeopardy The greed and the jealousy, it freed all these demons that was fed But still the sunshine spreads amongst the clouds And the thorns in the side of every rose Still every time, and never mind, I should have tried another time I could Try to sleep, cry tears from the lullaby Crocodile, wish I could go back in time And make all the wrong things right Just know that I tried, just know that I tried Cause in the times when you're stressed out You say stuff you don't mean What is it, an honesty, a convoluted honesty Most probably, I'm watching my past Like it's a movie, like watching Johnny English acting funny Used to skate around and plant beans And maybe soon, I'll go buy a tweed jacket And a white shirt and red tie Acting like a child, that's what we all do sometimes And I can't I can't deny, I'm a 21 year old soul With these butterflies, my stomach cries No surprise, I'm no good at goodbyes No complies, fakey ollie time in summertime My Franklin's and fans always wanted Red and green Adidas I feel I want to stand tall, stand still Feel I'm at a stand still Brick wall, getting out of bed is to stand still Bad vibes, pollution from the landfill of my mind It's like as long as I live, I can never get this right But I know that God did it right, did it right and he will always do it right, do it right. And God will always do it right, do it right. Yeah, well, that was it. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, uh, Matt and Mike. That was, <laughs> wow, just mind Absolutely blowing. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah, cool. So as we have moved around, I think you guys might have seen the photos over there. Um, so these photos are entries from our human photo competition. And now we are going to announce the winners of the photo competition. Yes. So I'd like to invite 
Pete Last, um, the president of the Christian Union, to announce the two winners of the photo competition. All right. And then I'm explaining. Cool. Okay. We've got a hand. Take a photo. Is it on? Yeah, great. Okay, so <laughs> I feel very unqualified to cho choose the winners for an art competition. But my girlfriend's an illustr illustrator, so I feel I've got some, some hope. So there's two photos which I've chosen as kind of the winners, as it were, although they're all excellent, of course. Um, so the first one is this one here. I don't know if, if a camera's going to zoom in on it or not. but um, So essentially, I chose this one. Um, so I was trying to mark them on uh, how human they were and trying to understand them from my perspective of what I, you know, when I look at it, what kind of humanity do I see coming out of it. So if, with this picture, as you can see, it's kind of like children jumping up in the air, um, a classic image of um, young human beings um, having fun. Um, and sorry, can you just... Yeah. There we go. <laughs> um, and this, this, this girl here, this is what sparked my interest. She's got her hands like clawed, um, which to be honest I quite re relate to. Um, and it reminds me of my childhood. Um, I have many siblings and we used to go out and jump on a trampoline in the back garden all the time and then it broke. Um, but I remember as a child enjoying that freedom uh, to go outside. We had a lovely garden um, and I think that just sparks interest in me because that's what I remember as my childhood, jumping up and down and being a bit of a widow. But that's great, that childhood, yeah. Like climbing a tree. Like climbing a tree, like climbing a tree. This one though, I, I feel like the second picture, I'm gonna be a bit biased. So I come from London and this is a picture of Camden. Uh, I first went to Camden when I was 16. My parents never took me as a child, but um, I've been in London for a long time. Um, and then I went to Camden the first time and I absolutely loved it. Uh, I went to London Zoo. And then I went up Primrose Hill and I walked down into Camden Town. Um, and uh, I liked how well dressed everyone was, um, as you might be able to tell from the fleece. Um, and that's part of my interest in that kind of area of London. Uh, I've, always, I've gone back many times since. I love the, the market there. Um, and as I said before, I'm biased. I come from London. Uh, I don't come from this side of London, but it's near enough. It's near enough. Um, and that's about as arty as I can get, you know. Um, clothes um, and what else was I going to say about London? Yeah, I guess I guess for London, London, the busyness of London is what attracts me to London. I like the fast-paced nature of life. Many of you look at this photo and think, "Ah, oh, no, I couldn't, I couldn't live in a place like that. I want my old village and you know a big old house in, in the countryside." I think no, I'd much rather live in Camden, where everything is busy, everyone's going somewhere, everyone is thinking. There's so much business, there's so much wonderful ideas going around. Um, a lot of creative arts are there as well. Um, and that, to me, is how I feel as a human being. I've, my head is full of ideas and things I want to do and places I want to go and I don't know. That's, to me, what Camden appeals to me. I don't know. That's, that's why I, to, I feel like it's a bit biased. I, I feel a bit unfair here saying that. But London is my home uh, and that what makes me feel at home. So, part of my human nature. Um, so, these two photos, uh, do check the other ones out as well. Uh, I feel like I rambled on for a bit now. Um, yeah, I've probably spoke for longer than you're expecting. Um, so much, Pete. Uh, so Great. <laughs> <laughs> Cut me off. <laughs> All right, uh, if we can have the prizes, I'd like to invite the winners of the, these um, two photos. Uh, so, this belongs to Diane, but apparently she's not here tonight, so we'll call on her friend as a representative, which is Joelle. And also, this photo belongs to Esther Zakari. Please give them a round of applause. It's not me, I haven't done anything. I haven't Congratulations. All right, the prizes are somewhere around the room. <laughs> Yeah, got it. Sorry. Yes, Pete, you do have to hand them to, <laughs> to the winners. Yeah, I'll, I'll the this again. is so your photo. Yeah. I believe they are ten pound gift cards. So to you and to you. Well done. Yay. Congratulations. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And once again, thank you to everyone who submitted a photo for our competition. We are now going to have a talk from Glenn. Um, Glenn, would you like to join us? Excellent.
context and we'll let you take it from here. Cool, cool. Um, just last night on Facebook, I saw a video that's been up for a couple of days and it's had 8 million views. What is it that could be viewed 8 million times? Why don't we have a look at this example of harmony, of beauty, of great artistry, and we'll see why it's got 8 million views. Let's have a look. tour to a, a great competition and they were in a hotel and so they just decided to start singing, giving everybody uh, a, uh, a concert impromptu and uh, yeah, that doesn't get 8 million views because of the cinematography, it gets 8 million views because, my goodness, isn't harmony incredible? Um, doesn't it sweep you up into a much grander vision for what life really is? And uh, just in the next couple of minutes, I want to I urge you to see that that is much closer to ultimate reality than other visions of life. You, you might think that you and I, we are just biological survival machines. You and I might just be wet robots, just trying to pass on our genes, clinging to an insignificant rock, hurtling through a meaningless universe towards eternal extinction. Well, listen to that. And I want to convince you tonight that, that that is far closer to ultimate reality. And you know it, because you respond to that. You know, that, that's just sound waves beating the air and making little bits of furniture in your ears kind of tweak and jump and writhe and little electrical signals are zapping in your brain, right? But you know that that's a terrible explanation for what you just heard. What, what you just heard was beauty. It was harmony, there was aesthetics, there was, there was something that's far closer to ultimate reality there than the way we tend to live our lives. We tend to think that this world is just a big factory space that just grinds along according to iron laws of physics. It tends to be how we view the world. It's been how we viewed the world since the Enlightenment, since the scientific method was discovered, since we decided to treat this world like a machine. But you know the world's not a machine, right? And you really know it when you hear Mike Hood give you poetry, right? You, 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 you really know it when you hear a choir like that sing in harmony. You really know it when you see beauty over there or you just enjoy a cupcake, right? You, you, you know because this world is full of laughter and love and lemon drizzle cake. But this is not a grinding mass of gears just pounding along according to iron laws of physics. You, you know that, don't you? You know what ultimate reality is. Ultimate reality is love and beauty, and truth, 
goodness, harmony, artistry. You know that right now what's happening is that uh, here is one conscious mind thinking according to some kind of rationality, expressing itself in some kind of language. It's being received by your conscious mind and your understanding of language and emotion and rhetoric and logic. And what do you notice about all those things that I've just described? They are all utterly immaterial, utterly immaterial. My mind, my rationality, my language, my emotion, your mind, your rationality, your emotion, your rhetoric, your logic. What do you notice about all those things? Utterly immaterial. How non what a nonsense idea it is to think that what's under our feet physically is what is most real in the world. It's not most real in the world at all. Even as you crunch down on the hard floor, you realize that actually that floor is not what's most real. Your experience of that floor consciously is far closer to who you are than that floor, right? You are a mind experiencing music. And, and you know that minds and music and mercy and morals and metaphysics and all these other M's that I'm running out of, miracles, right? You, you know that all those things are, are far more real, far more close to the center of who you are than matter in motion, right? You know that. You know that. But what do you think? I don't know. What do you think is ultimate reality? You've got these uh, Mark's Gospels there on your table. Why don't you pick one up? And let me just show you just a couple of verses from this to prove to you what you already know. You already know that you're not just a biological survival machine clinging to an insignificant rock hurtling through a meaningless universe. You know that. You just heard that choir. So you know that, but let me just prove to you that it's true. If, you, if, you, if you're still are wavering on this, have a look at page two of this. You, you'll, you'll notice that this, the first 90 pages of this is actually Mark's Gospel, which is a biography of Jesus' life. It's one of the 66 books that make up the Bible. And here in this biography of Jesus, it begins on page two, John the Baptist prepares the way, and then it says, the beginning of the good news, right? And as Mark, the writer of this biography, begins, he's actually making you think of another famous book that begins in the beginning. Does that ring any bells? Maybe if you've ever picked up the Bible, you might have picked it up and just started to read from page one. It's a perfectly logical thing to do. And maybe you read the first sentence and it said, the beginning, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? In the beginning is a really great way of starting to think about ultimate reality. Have you ever thought about what was there in the beginning? See, if you were to hit rewind on life, and you kept going back before there are planets, before there are people, before there are protons, what do you think was there in the beginning? What do you think was there? I reckon you've kind of got four options. People, people think either in the beginning there was nothing, there was chaos, there was power, or there was love. Those are your four options, really. A lot of people think that in the beginning there was nothing. Maybe that's what you think. Like before the universe began, you, you just thought, well, what could there be before the universe? The universe is everything, right? Well, it'd be a strange view of the world, wouldn't it? That in the beginning there's nothing, and then all of a sudden everything comes from nothing, and for no good reason. That would be an extraordinary thing to think, don't you think? I'm a Christian, so I believe in the virgin birth of Jesus, but this would be the virgin birth of the cosmos and without a virgin. It's quite stunning, isn't it? It's the ultimate magic trick, isn't it? Nothing up the sleeve, no sleeve, no magician. Just pure magic out of nowhere and for no reason. Nothing, 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 everything. Why? No reason. Well, it's, it's one view of the world. But if it was true, it would mean that everything is, is utterly absurd because actually, at the end of all things, there is no reason for you. There's no purpose for you. It's the ultimate absurdity. Life is the ultimate absurdity if everything has come from nothing. If in the beginning there was nothing, then life is ultimately absurd. Well, then other people say, I know, in the beginning there wasn't nothing. In the beginning there was chaos, right? And there are religious views of this and there are non-religious views of this. The, the, the religious views of this are if you go into the near, 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 ancient, uh, near, near Eastern 
uh, ancient myths of, of, uh, of antiquity, you'll discover all sorts of myths about where we've come from. And there's, there's battling deities that are fighting it out. And maybe creation is explained as kind of the, the, the place of exile for a naughty deity. Or it's the body of a dead god or something like that. Or, you know, there are, there are non-religious views of the chaos story. Where have we come from? Bang. Crash. Selfishness, 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 selfishness. And here we all are. That would be a chaos story, right? Where have we come from? Have we come from, have we come from chaos, battling deities or just bat battling physical forces? Is that ultimate reality? If so, then life is war. It's a fight. It's a battle. You get on top, and then you're toppled, and then you're dead. Right? That's, that's life. If in the beginning there was nothing, then... It's absurdity. If in the beginning there was chaos, then life is war. Maybe then you think in the beginning there was power. You don't like the idea that there's just chaos swirling. So you think that there's someone calling the shots or something. And again, there's a non-religious and a religious version of this. The non-religious version says, you know, in the beginning there were iron laws of physics and we danced to their tune. Okay? So there's a power. An, immaterial, impersonal power above us. The religious version is similar. The religious version says, you know who's, who's calling the shots? God. But you ask the person, well, which God are you talking about? Who, who is this God who is calling the shots? And essentially, it's just power personified, right? There is just some individual who is calling the shots. They're in charge of things. And whether you are religious or irreligious on this question, if you think power is in charge, then we are slaves, right? Life is slavery. God or the law calls the tune and we must dance along. That's what life is. So if in the beginning there's nothing, then life's absurd. If in the beginning there's chaos, then life is war. If in the beginning there is power, then life is slavery. But actually, the Bible says, in the beginning, there was love. Well, that's good news, isn't it? In the beginning, there was love. Because here in Mark's gospel, he's kind of recapitulating the old story of Genesis. And he's saying, look, Jesus, the Son of God, has come to redo creation and to bring us the, the good news of the original goodness of God. Here is the, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And if you go down to verse 9, you'll, you'll see how Jesus comes into our world to invite us into a love that both predated and produced the universe. Verse 9, little number 9, three quarters of the way down the page. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. According to the Bible, this love was there before the world began. There has always been a father who has been loving his son in the joy of the Holy Spirit. This is where we've come from. We've come from harmony. We've come from beauty. We've come from artistry. We've come from a united family of love. What do you think? Do you think that could be true? I think everything that resonates within you, everything that resonates with artistry and beauty and harmony and poetry and creativity, everything within you that, that resonates with those things is telling you right now you have not come from nothing or chaos or power. Ultimately, you've come from love. That is home for you. I've done a video about it. Why don't we have a look at the, this video? In the beginning, it's called. In the beginning, ink still wet, primeval paths positioned, set, creation's canopy clipped in place, potential fixed in time and space. What force began that first beginning? What set the world and galaxies spinning? What weight subsists beneath all things? What source from which this splendor springs? It seems to me you have four choices, four competing primal voices. Something calls the tune above. Is it nothing, chaos, power, or love? 
Now nothing is a strange headwaters, as old King Lear said to his daughters. Nothing will come of nothing, and yet some think non-entities begin. And yes, their nothing's an ancient rumbling, a giant cavernous black old something. But if in every sense it's naught, then life's a miracle, absurdly wrought. And all our days are spent suspended over the abyss to which we're tended, laughing, learning, living, loving, but pushed beneath it's really nothing. Life's a breath and soon exhale, the darkest winds, the lightest fail. We burn our lamps, but night is crowned, blackness born to blackness bound. And so to chaos some will turn, primeval punch-ups their concern, bangs and blasts and battles war, these begot us in days of yore. The myths of old saw earth deriving from the deities conniving. Warring gods began the trouble, we are just the cosmic rubble. Still today we have our clashes, life emerges from the ashes of stars exploding, species striving, the weak devoured, the strong surviving. And if we live with this regime, then selfishness must reign supreme. It's dog eat dog, you get ahead until you're toppled and then you're dead. But maybe you think life is more than endless struggle, pointless war. Perhaps above the chaos towers, some all-controlling cosmic powers. And in the beginning there was the law of gravity or something more. This power reigns, all must succumb and dance to its relentless drum. And then the faith head comes along, essentially sings the same old song. There is a sovereign, we are awed. Let's call this boundless power God. And in the beginning, imagine a throne. Power personified and all alone. No back and forth, no give and take. This self exists for self's own sake. If such a God decrees creation, creatures have but one relation. God's a cosmic chairman Mao. Defined by might, his world must bow. And so religious folk are sated, rendering reverence unabated, from nothing and from chaos saved, yet under power now enslaved. Is this how Christians see the matter? Got a narcissist to flatter? If this were true, all hope's bereft. But there is another option left. We read in Genesis and John a life of love before the dawn, a father, son and spirit bound in self poured out and losing found. In back and forth these three delight and share one life of radiant light. Behold this deferential dance, this ancient and profound romance. This is the bubbling brook that burst the banks of endless love, immersed to flood all else with light and longing, soak our souls with true belonging. This the pulse of all creation, this the primitive vibration, this all nature's explanation. In the beginning, adoration. Where are the well-adjusted minds? Which faith to deepest truth aligns? For all will hold that love is first, but in their creed the ranks reversed. We live as though self-giving's best, we deem a life of service blessed, we spend our lives as loved and lover, and then conclude it's all a cover? For if nothing's our source, then life's absurd. If chaos, then war's the final word. If power, then all of us are slaves. And yet it's love the whole world craves. So what's our beginning? Our answers count, both now and next spring from this fount. Which sovereign ruler reigns above? Nothing, chaos, power, or love? Well, that'll do for tonight, I think, in terms of where we want to get to. But uh, maybe you could continue that conversation on your table groups. Just, just think about where have we come from? Do you believe the nothing story, the chaos story, the power story, the love story? I think we all think that uh, the love story might be greatest. I think tonight our heads will hit the pillow, and if today has been a good day in which loving relationships have gone well, you'll think that is a day well spent. That's life. And if today relationships have gone badly, you'll think, oh gosh, it's hell on earth, won't you? You'll, you'll think, this has been a dreadful day, this has been death. Because we all, we all know that love is the greatest thing, and, and here we are, we're Christians, and we're, we're saying, maybe you think that love is the greatest thing because God, the greatest thing, is love. And maybe he's inviting you home. It's worth investigating, don't you think? Here's some ways that you can investigate that. Why don't you keep on reading through Mark's gospel? Keep on. I've, I've given you a little taste of the opening page. Why not keep on reading through this? And shoot up a prayer and just say, God, if this is real, show me. It's one of those no-lose propositions. If he's not there, he's not going to answer. But if he is there, wouldn't it be amazing to be invited into the love that has birthed this world? So 
You can pick that up and read it. Or, or why don't you pick up uh, this book? It's called Love Story. Uh, it's a little book that I've written about how the Bible is the great love story that you are invited into. If you like that theme, why don't you ask me and I'll, I'll get you a copy. Um, I think on the back uh, it might be a pound, but if you come and say hello to me, I might even give it to you for free. How about that? Uh, but let's get into these conversations and let's ask Let's ask whether tonight has just been a thin layer of gloss on the dead rubble of this universe. Is that what you think? Is tonight just a thin layer of gloss, just a nice sweet bit of icing where we think about love and beauty and goodness, but actually this world is a machine. What do you, what do you think? Is, is that what tonight is? Is tonight just a thin layer of gloss on the top of some dead rubble? Or are we in touch tonight with something that goes very deep and very old? Maybe there's a God of love and maybe he's inviting you home. We'd love you to keep investigating these things. I'm going to hand back to the guys. They can tell you how to take things further. Thanks so much. Thank you, thank you very much, Glenn, and um, all of our other um, performers tonight. We will be bringing the evening to a close now, but before we do, we'd like to tell you uh, about a few things, including our following events coming up. So the Christian Union have events for the rest of Events Week, uh, especially tomorrow we have a lunchtime talk from 1 to 2 and 12 to 1. <laughs> This uh, is going to be given by Mike Hood, who gave us a poem earlier. And he'll be asking the question, are we free to be ourselves? Then, at 6 o'clock tomorrow, uh, we've got a free meal and a talk. And it's all about identity. Now, uh, this, it's going to be at Portsmouth Church, and this meal is specifically geared towards internationals. So if you're an international student, I do recommend, go along to that. Um, but for everyone else as well, you're welcome to come. So do come along and enjoy that meal. Finally, at the same time tomorrow, quarter to eight, we have another talk here with Glenn. He's going to be interviewing um, uh, the former football player, uh, football coach, and commentator, Dave Merrington. And they're going to be discussing decisions uh, here at Highfield Church. Now, if you were particularly uh, spoken to uh, by this question of, well, where does the universe come from? Maybe you're thinking, well, maybe it does come from love, but how do I find out more about this? How can I learn further about this love? Well, we've got a video explaining how you can join us in uh, exploring this love further. Hey there, we just wanted to say thank you for coming to today's event, and we really hope that you've enjoyed it. If you still have questions and you want to explore Christianity further after this week of events, then the Christian Union will be running a four-week series of nights entitled Being Human. Each night will be on a Thursday, commencing from the 21st of February, running for four weeks in Building 34, Room 5007. If you find it hard to find a building, there'll be people in blue jumpers outside the library from 7.15 to help you find your way. Each night will include free pizza, a short talk, and space for discussion afterwards. You can ask anything that's on your mind. If you've wanted to try reading the Bible, then we'd love to tell you about Uncover. Uncover is an eyewitness account of Jesus' life written by the Apostle Mark. It's jam-packed with resources, links, and Bible studies for you to do with a friend. If you'd like to take one away with you, there's plenty here for you. If you'd like to read through Uncover with a friend, then we'd love to tell you about Coffee and a Chat. If you'd like to meet up with a Christian and go through Uncover with them, or just have a conversation and ask them any questions you might have, text us at 077 849 84002. And from there, we can organize a meetup. It can be a coffee, it can be a pint, it can be anything you like. If you'd like to try out church, feel free to talk to someone at the Christian Union about the different churches that there are in Southampton. And they'll be more than happy to help you find someone to go with you. Again, thank you for coming, and we hope to see you again soon. Excellent. All that information can be found on the flyers on your tables. Right. As Matt has said in the video earlier, um, we would like you to explore more um, through the Uncover book that is on the table, and feel free to take them home with you. Um, they are for you. Um, also, as we have seen earlier, there were two videos um, that Glenn showed for us from the books that he wrote, um, Love Story and Divine Comedy. 
Um, so we have a bookstore at the end of the room, and these books are sold in reduced prices, so feel free to check them out. Um, lastly, we have some white cards on the tables. Uh, they are the feedback forms. Um, please do take a moment to fill these out because uh, this creative evening is our very first time as well as a Christian union and would love to hear your thoughts and comments and suggestions of how we can do better next time. Um, finally, do stay, chat, explore more, look at the photos or take more cupcakes. And yeah, we'll see you tomorrow. We will see you tomorrow, hopefully. Yeah. Good night. Good night. <laughs>